So we're very excited to share with you what we have in store for the practice, what we're bringing in. And um, this started off for me as a quest to try to find a way to help some of the patients that I have that have complicated and complex medical problems that no one else in medicine seemed to be able to help, sadly including me. And so I was looking for ways to do things differently, do things better. And along the way on that journey, I, I realized that the principles I was learning, the things I was learning about really applied to all of us and to the you know, active management and maintenance of our health. And I wanted to find a way to, to bring that in. And so um, as I was looking for how to do that, how to bring that into the practice, I came across the path of uh, the people at N1 Health. And, uh, Mr. Blue is also the executive director of the American Academy of Private Physicians, the national organization for um, concierge physicians. And so, uh, you know, I was aware of him from that experience with that organization. So um, anyway, without any further ado, um, I would like to have you join me in welcoming. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Tom Blue. most of the time when I talk to people it's, it's, it's a room full of doctors and uh, and so you all are an unusual breed of, of patients uh, in so much as the vast majority of you all are, are members of this practice yes so so it's unusual to have a chance to talk to people who have seen fit on their own to invest in help and um, at the same time I have to confess I'm a little because You've all gotten a letter that, that is monkeying around with an important relationship in your life, and I'm a complete stranger here to try and talk to you about it. And so, anyway, I, I, I would confess my nervousness up front because I'm not, you know, this is not a normal conversation for me. Um, to explain what it is that we want to do, I'd like to embark on an explanation first of why we want to do it. We, um, we're an unusual company in so much as we have a, a, an odd belief that I think you'll, can everybody hear me okay by the way? I have a microphone here if I need to use it. In the, you can hear? Yes? Okay. You know, we have a strange belief and that is that we, we believe that people actually can create the health that they want for themselves, which is a, a strange thing to say in this day and time. To do it, however, requires a unique part of the doctor. And it's a doctor that needs to be untethered, as Dr. Burke is, from the restraints of the payer system uh, to make decisions that are always in the best interest of the patient. Uh, needs to be a doctor properly trained with a high degree of passion for what they're doing and uh, someone equipped with certain technologies that are required in order to do this sort of work very well. And so that's our belief. And, and everything that, uh, that, that's been communicated to you about what we're doing with the, with the practice is in pursuit of creating a, uh, a very unique little island in the world of American healthcare where we're aiming to create health and in doing that, hopefully teach <coughs> other people to do the same thing and spread this so that, that while only today a small group of people will take advantage of this and have access to it, our intention is, is that this might proliferate. So let's talk a little bit about why and how we happen to be in the place that we are and set the context for what it is that we're doing. And then we'll talk second about what exactly it is that we're, that we're doing differently. So you all are a unique breed of patients because you are patients of a concierge physician. And as Christine mentioned, I, I run the National Association of Concierge Physicians. And so I, I deal with the media a lot in that, in that line of work. And about a couple months ago, in mid-August, this story came out in the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if anybody saw this but it made great ripples in the world of private medicine. Because essentially this uh, fellow John Goodman, who has all sorts of credentials to, to make statements like this, has declared that private medicine is inevitable. And you know, after looking at the marketplace, it's, it's an inescapable fact that for better or for worse, uh, we, are, we are embarking on uh, what, what he would say is a two-tiered medical system. And the thing that's interesting about it, while a lot of people in private medicine circles sort of, sort of cheered for this and it was validating, at the same time, it was, it was a little depressing 
you know, from my perspective and that of a number of our physicians, because the problem that makes the private medical phenomenon inevitable is this one in this story. This is a graph I have been talking about for probably the better part of 10 years, and in many respects, this is a picture of inevitability. What it shows is this blue line here that goes up so sharply is, is our, our population of people over 65 years of age. The black line is our population of physicians. And so what you see is, and what this article is about, is, is this growing shortage of doctors, which is only getting worse uh, as a result of health care reform, as a result of, of what's called silent attrition, more and more doctors going into the uh, employment of hospitals and out of the active practice of medicine, closing their practices down, and it's becoming harder and harder for people to access a doctor. And so people say private medicine is inevitable because we have a supply and demand crisis. You know, while this is true, and this is a big deal, well, out of curiosity, does anybody, of the members of the practice, anybody join primarily to lock down a doctor, you know, given a coming shortage of physicians? Was that anybody's primary motivation? I don't think so either. And yet, you know, in the business press, this is what, what gets all the coverage. What we're more concerned with is this graph, which is a picture of healthcare expenditures. And what you see is, is that while the government has a slightly more optimistic perspective, that essentially if, if historical trends continue, by the year 2044, we will spend 100% of the government budget on Medicare and Medicaid and at today's level of taxation. And so the same, of course, is true of private insurers. By far, our largest industry is, is, is that of healthcare. And so while I'm sure in tonight's debates and, and when we hear this in the news, this is presented as a cost problem. You know, the cost, it's healthcare inflation. Well, in fact, that is political speak for we're getting sicker as a country and we can't seem to do anything about it. And it's really weird because we're spending more and more money on technology and more advanced drugs and interventions and yet we keep getting sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where if this doesn't stop and bend, we're gonna bankrupt the country and bankrupt many of our employers who underwrite health plans. And so this is the problem you know, that preoccupies the most advanced thinking private physicians and, and, and many other folks. But this is, this is really what we're here to talk, to talk about today. And so I want to take you on a little, a little journey of how it is that this happens to be the case in the face of our incredible investment and growing investment in healthcare. And it has to do with the history of medicine in a simple way that, that all of us can understand. I'm not a doctor, by the way. I'm, I'm a patient like you all are. But if you look at the the history of medicine, it's kind of broken into three eras. The first one is the longest by far. Essentially, since the dawn of time up until about the middle of the, of the last century, you know, the, the preoccupation of, of, of healthcare was infectious disease. You know, you cut your hand and suddenly that can be a life-threatening thing, infections. You know, things just strike you out of the clear blue sky. And so logically, with that being the case, you know, scientists and physicians were, were mostly concerned with that. And, and you know, this is Louis Pasteur, and you can see that that what this what this era kind of etched into the mind, the medical minds of people, patients as well as doctors, was that health problems are essentially little invaders that creep in and suddenly take over our bodies, and that if we can find their vulnerability, we can intervene and solve the problem. And so, this first era thinking gave rise to the concept of, of the magic bullet, you know, the, the antibiotic, the antiviral. And it spawned an industry as well as, a, as well as a way of thinking about health problems, that everything is a disease and for every disease, if only we can fashion the appropriate magic bullet to solve it, you know, we're good to go. And emboldened by the victory in the first era against infectious disease, this was a logical way to proceed into the second era in the middle of the last century. So, off we go into the second era of medicine in the mid-1900s, and we added an element of strategy to the mix. And, and we, because there are more doctors, we decided that we would divide and conquer our diseases. We would, we would separate them into smaller parts, and they would be more vulnerable, and we would tackle them that way. And so we organized our troops, our physicians, along the lines of geography, organ systems. Where's the problem? You know, you take the heart, and you take the kidneys, and you take the liver, and you take the brain, and and, and if we separate out the enemy this way, it'll become more vulnerable. And this made sense. And our entire system is built around this. Our, our whole healthcare system is built around these siloed specialties. 
and the strategy is divide and conquer and seek out magic bullets. And of course, a giant industry has been created out of the pursuit of the, of the subtle vulnerabilities of the things that plague us as health problems. 60 years into the second era, we can see that this strategy is not working at all and needs to be changed. Now, along the way, oops, we've learned a couple of things. We've learned, most importantly, that what we initially thought of as discrete diseases, you know, we're attacking, we've, we've taken in the second era, we've shifted our focus from infectious diseases to things like heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and cancer and the things that, you know, kind of going down the hierarchy of things likely to kill us. And so what we've learned about these diseases over time, and this is not disputed at all, is that these things actually aren't separate. You know, a heart attack, a stroke, erectile dysfunction, macular degeneration, hypertension, diabetes, they all largely flow from the same spring of dysfunction. And they're very interrelated with one another. But because the system is, is deeply entrenched and invested in its own, in its approach to, to, to medicine, we cling to the idea of these conditions as something called comorbidities. Does anybody, this is a familiar term. This is, a, this is what, what researchers, if you have, anybody ever participate in a clinical trial, clinical research? Okay, so when you get recruited into clinical research, you'll find that, that the recruiting criteria, you get interviewed a good bit about what's wrong with you. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to eliminate you know, these confounding variables, the other things. So if they're gonna study hypertension, they wanna find somebody who's hypertensive but doesn't have diabetes and doesn't have other, other problems. And it's hard to find those people. That's why the recruitment's so difficult. You see ads on television. Because we're, we're, we're still married to the idea of isolating things that we know aren't isolated. And so we've learned this about, about disease. But yet, we cling to this idea that they, that they can be dealt with separately. We are married to an acute care mentality, meaning that you know, the system has, 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 because of its first era orientation, decided that in order to intervene, something has to be really wrong. And so we know at the same time that things like diabetes and things like heart attacks and strokes, they don't happen overnight. They're not like the flu where one day you wake up in the middle of the night and you're sick and it's, you know, you've been stricken by a bug. You know, these are things that, that, that materialize very slowly over 15, 20 years before they ever manifest as an acute condition, as a heart attack or as a full-blown diagnosis of diabetes. But yet, because of our first era orientation, we wait until things are full-blown diagnoses, till you have a heart attack, or till you have full-blown diabetes in order to intervene. Here in this market, I was talking to Christine about this, we've invented, not just in this market, but across the country, we've invented the idea of pre-disease. So has anybody ever heard of, oh, I'm pre-diabetic, or I'm pre-hypertensive? You know, this is the most absurd invention. You know, diabetes is just, this is a continuum, and someone decided, you know, that when you cross this line with your blood sugar, you're now diabetic. If you go to Europe, you can be cured of diabetes because they've decided the line's a little further. And so you can go back and forth. It's, it's just, it's on the face of it, it's ridiculous. And so, but we, but nevertheless, to, to, to validate our outdated approach, we invent the idea of pre-disease. And what does that do? Pre-disease, if you're told, oh, you're pre-diabetes, you say, oh, well, that's, thank goodness I don't have diabetes. And so what do you do? You sit back and you wait until you have full-blown diabetes, and then insurance will pay for your nutritional counseling. Pre-diabetes isn't good enough, you need the high octane diagnosis of the full thing. And so, and so this is you know, another legacy of the first era thinking that's causing our country so much problem. Why? Because if you intervene in the disease and the progression you know, early on, when you're only insulin resistant, which is an easy thing to detect, you know, simple lifestyle modifications can redirect the trajectory of your health. If you wait until you're full-blown diabetic, you've incurred all kinds, it has the cardiovascular risk equivalent of having had a heart attack to wait that long. It's literally like waiting until the house is burned to the ground before you call a fire department. But that's how the system works, and it's largely a product of how our payer system has evolved. And that's not a, entirely a criticism of the payer system, but it is a criticism of the passivity that it casts on top of the patient population and the restraints that it puts on the physician population to act when things can really be dealt with efficiently and, in, and, 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 and without a great deal of pain and suffering and a great deal of expense. So we don't just stop there, though. We've taken things further. These are, these are pictures of book covers that I found only about a week and a half ago when I Googled the term healthy 
with chronic disease. And then I tried Sick Healthy. And, and so I went into the images and I saw these book covers. This is two books and an app. And if you look at it, what, we, what these books signify, and they're not unusual, there are lots of books like this, is kind of you know, the, 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 the gentle defeat that we've been eased into by our sick care industry, where we've created and accepted an oxymoron, that we can be well and sick at the same time. We can be healthy with chronic disease. We can learn to be sick well. And so what we're, it, it's on the face of it, it's, it's absurd, but yet, this is, this is what we've been lulled into believing. And I cannot tell you how many, I spend most of my time in conferences where doctors are talking. I'll sit in the back of the room and I'll be listening. I can't believe how often I hear doctors tell other doctors in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget that being healthy is not the same thing as being symptom free or not being sick. You know, but our culture and, and, and what we're communicating is that eh, if I don't hurt right now, I must be I must be well. You know, I'm taking four medications, but I don't I don't have any pain that I'm aware of, so I'm healthy. You know, sick is not the uh, healthy is not the same as not sick, but yet we're hypnotized into believing that it is. We've spent a long time fighting a war that you know in the second era of medicine that has our defeat has been predicted 200 years ago by a French astronomer and mathematician and he has this great quote and and you know as soon as I saw this I was like you know this is in fact what's plaguing us today he says infinitely varied in its effects nature is simply is simple only in its causes its economy consists in producing a great number of phenomena often very complicated by means of a small number of general laws what an incredible a poetic thing to say but an incredibly true thing to say when you think about our health you know the, the American healthcare system is very much in the business of fighting an infinite variety of complicated phenomena, hypertension and diabetes, and, 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 and we play whack-a-mole if you've ever seen that game in, you know, in medicine where things just pop up and you whack the symptom, you whack the symptom, you, and the goal is just to keep people kind of symptom free. And that, of course, we've convinced ourselves is the same thing as keeping people healthy. And so this is a battle we know we're going to lose. But Yet the first era refuses to release its grip. Now this is a slide I always show doctors and they really, and they chuckle at it because they understand what these codes mean. Anybody recognize this, this, this ICD-10? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have one person in the group. So here's how this, here's how this works in, in, in the world of healthcare. In order to get something paid for by your insurance, <coughs> doctors need to attach some reason why the insurance company should pay for it. And so they use something called an icd today nine code and it stands for the international statistical classification of diseases and health related problems and today we operate in a system that's called ICD-9 and in the ICD-9 world there are tw roughly 12,000 diseases for the doctors to choose from and so confronted with you know our, our epic battle in the second era with with health care inflation and the declining health of our nation and the incredible mountain of evidence that diseases are in fact maybe not diseases at all but simply progressive steps on a continuum towards more and more dysfunction you know diabetes heart disease etc the system has chosen to, to essentially double down on its divide and conquer strategy and graduate to ICD-10 so in about a year we're not going to doctors no longer have 12,000 choices they'll have 150,000 diseases and health related problems to choose from down to the level of bitten by a turtle is literally <laughs> coded. Burnt by your jet ski engine has a code in the ICD-10 you know, you know, you know, menu. So, so we've, we've taken a bad idea and we've multiplied it by an order of magnitude. And, and in doing so, this decision puts everyone at a crossroads, you know, both doctors as well as patients. The system stood at the crossroads of, of do we continue on a failed strategy or do we not? And the system has decided to, as I said, double down on its divide and conquer strategy by, by you know, order of magnitude increase in, in the menu of diseases. But it also puts doctors at a crossroads and by extension, it puts patients at a crossroads. And the crossroads is, you know, as a doctor, and unfortunately, the doctors who are really able to make a conscious choice about this are private physicians because they've already kind of decoupled themselves you know, from, from, the, from the dependence on the insurance payer system to decide for them what they do. And, 
And the, the question for a doctor is, do I continue along this strategy and follow along in the face of a mountain of evidence, or do I do things differently? And patients, likewise, you know, although very, very few people are actually conscious of, what, of, of either the history we've just discussed or the decision that, that we're confronted with, you know, are, are able to make a decision about it. But you know, generally in partnership with a doctor, you know, patients are confronted with a similar choice. And the choice is, if, if we're not to continue on that path, then we really know, doctors as well as patients, what it is that we need to do. We need to initiate the third era of medicine and simply accept our defeat in the second era and change the question. The second era, as well as the first, the question in the minds of doctors is, is that of what? What is the disease? What is the diagnosis? What is the pill or what is the intervention to resolve the disease? You know, that's the, that's the resounding question of the second era. The question, as our 200-year-old astronomer and mathematician told us, is not what, but why. Why is there a problem here? Why is there dysfunction in this person's health? Because, you know, underneath of why are a handful of simple laws. Underneath of what is an infinite or array of variety of complex phenomena. And so the question is why? Now, that's for doctors to ask. The doctor's job in the third era of medicine is going to be to fixate on the question of why there's a problem, not what the problem is and what the pill is to solve it. The patient in the third era also has a job to do and has an evolution to make, and it's a tricky, difficult one, to be perfectly honest. I've had to endure this myself a little bit, well, a lot. The question for the patient is one that patients never are asked anywhere to my knowledge in healthcare, and that is, what do you want to create for your health? In the first era of medicine, the old, old days, health and disease, yeah, it's like a lightning bolt. You know, you're walking along one day and, you know, something pops out of your head and you die. You know, and so that, you know, health and disease was something completely out of control of people in the colonial times and, and, and the late 1800s, early 1900s. It just happened. And there was, you couldn't see it coming, and you really couldn't do much to change it once it happened. In the second era, we've, we've replaced you know, the, the randomness of health problems with a new idol that we talk about, hear about all the time. And it's a tough one to wean yourself from, which is prevention. The goal in the mind of the, se of the second era patient is to prevent disease. And guess what? That's a tough one to, you know, to overtake because it sounds good. Who, who wants, I don't want to have disease, I want to prevent disease. The orientation of the second era is problematic in so much as by definition, prevention is about simply avoiding what you do not want which you need to do. You don't want to have disease, and so you do want to prevent it. But the primary goal of the third era needs to not only be to prevent what you don't want, but to create what you do want. And to begin to look at your health as the asset that in fact it is. You know, as a country, we've done a miserable job of managing arguably our most valuable asset, which is the health of our entire citizens. You know, individually, most people don't think about their health as an asset. Is anybody in here by chance in the, like financial advisory field. Okay, so we have a couple of folks. So, all right, as a financial advisor, would you say your goal is to keep people from being bankrupt? Yeah, well, you don't want them to be bankrupt, but they're like probably there for something more. They envision a retirement one day, they want to accumulate assets, and you work with them, you understand what they want, and you would devise a plan taking into account their risk tolerance to get them where they want when they want to get there, understanding what they're willing to compromise today in order to get there, yeah? You, the asset management metaphor is a perfect metaphor for the third era of medicine as it pertains to patients. You should engage your doctor, not unlike a person engages an asset manager, and say, okay, here's what I want for the future of my health. You know, here's where I am today. How do we get there together? And along the way, sure, if you get sick, let's stamp out the, you know, put out the fire, and, and along the way, if, if, you know, if, if we see something on the horizon, let's prevent it. But primarily, we should be about creating what it is that we do want, like you do in the world of asset management. Well, this is what, what In One Health is all about. We are a, um, this is a company that, that, uh, that I helped to create a few years ago that is really, more than anything else, an investment fund that takes an active investment interest in, and plays an active role in practices that we, that we invest in. And we don't have a lot of them. We, we identify practices that we want to work with, you know, not really on the basis of where the practice happens to be or, or really taking much into account the, the, the specifics of the patient population. We're hunting for doctors that can ask the question why 
and, and do it passionately and also have the skills and the training you know, to make something of those answers. And you know, I, just by pure coincidence and good fortune, I happened to stumble upon Dr. Burke. We, we met here and then, and then we crossed paths like days later at, at, a, at a conference down in the Los Angeles area. And this conference was entirely about teaching physicians to ask the question why, to narrow things down to the small number of general laws. And there she is soaking this in. You know, with every intention of going back and trying to apply it. And there are a, a handful of doctors like this. They're not nearly as many as you would wish that there are, but there are a handful. And the reason there aren't more, I would argue, it's not that doctors are bad or stupid. It's that in order to ask the question why and do anything about it, you have to have the time to do something about it. You can't, you, you don't answer why and create what you want out of health in five minute visits, you know, for five dollar copays or whatever. And so she's a private physician. So she has the latitude to both train herself on this and explore new ways of practicing medicine. And as we talk, it became clear that she's very likely to become someone who will lead the third era of medicine and set an example for other people. And so she's in somewhat good company. We have a practice down in, in Scottsdale, Arizona uh, that deals very heavily with, with a corporate clientele and people with odd autoimmune issues. We have a practice in Virginia that I think has probably more executive teams of corporations in it than any other one in the country. Uh, it has a White House physician practicing in it who runs our telemedicine. This is a person you'll actually meet sometime because the telemedicine uh, effort uh, touches all of the practices. But it's a small but growing number of, of, of people that we regard as, as high potential, very special doctors. And so what we do, now let's talk about chapter two here. What are we actually doing? This is the background, why? Now let's talk about what we do. So what we do is this. This is a funky picture. And we probably recognize this guy, Winston Churchill. Anybody recognize the other guy out of curiosity? Jim Fix. Jim Fix, okay. So, so this is a guy who kind of is you know, the father of the sport of running. And when you look at these two, you kind of think, okay, I know who's healthy in this picture. But oddly enough, you know, shortly after this picture was taken, Jim Fix drops dead of a heart attack. Our man Winston here goes on to live to 90, smoking, drinking, you know, obese, you know. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a bizarre thing that you know, didn't just happen back in the old days. It happens all the time. You know, this, this, this issue of who's really healthy and who's not is, is not, it's very deceiving. And I'll tell you, today, as back then I'm sure, the most discriminated against person in the healthcare system is someone who looks fit and healthy. You walk in looking like Jim Fix to most doctor's offices and they're gonna say, hey, keep up the good work. You know, Pass me the you know the overweight diabetic smoker you know and so you know because by all outward appearance this guy's looking great. Well, the problem is that when you actually understand what killed this fellow, you know, a heart attack, you you learn very quickly that you can't you often often can't judge a book by its cover. Now, what's crazy about cardiovascular disease is that we know enough today that very few people really need to have a heart attack or a stroke. And, and you know, to be clear, roughly half the population uh, you know, of Americans, men and women, will die of some form of cardiovascular disease. It's by far our largest killer. By far the most overwhelming cost burden on employers that underwrite health plans. And oddly enough, it's probably the most tragically misunderstood condition in all of, in all of medicine today. And it kind of, th this picture sort of, it sort of echoes you know, what happens even, even today, because if you want to prevent a heart attack, you go to the doctor, they draw, they draw your blood, and, and you know, what are they looking for? Cholesterol. cholesterol. <coughs> Two-thirds of people who have a heart attack have perfectly normal cholesterol. You know, it's the most bizarre phantom risk factor there is. If you really want to be certain that you're not going to have a heart attack, they pop you up on a treadmill, and what do they do? Stress, stress, stress. stress test, the gold seal. 86% of people who have a heart attack today would pass a stress test last week. Stress tests aren't designed to look for the type of disease burden that, you know, that, that precedes most heart attacks. Heart attacks have two ingredients, and they're very, very misunderstood and, and very poorly applied to medicine. Here's a crazy statistic. Using standard measures of risk, 88% of people who have a heart attack or a stroke today would be deemed low to moderate risk yesterday. You know, now, if you're high risk using standard measures of risk, you're at risk. You know, there's no question about that. But low risk doesn't mean a thing. And it's not because we don't have the sense or the technology to assess the risk. The problem is we don't apply it. 
And part of the reason that we don't apply it has to do with the way the structure of the system. Again, not blaming the system, but blaming the system only in so much as it doesn't teach people how to understand and manage their own risks. The problem is, half the people will die of, of, of cardiovascular disease. Of that half, half will discover it. So 25% of the population roughly will discover they have cardiovascular disease with the same first symptom. Anybody have an idea what that symptom might be? Sudden death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a rotten way to learn you're sick. And so, given that sudden death is 50% of the time your first symptom, it really kind of messes with your mind when you think about the way our payer system requires you to have symptoms before it wants to pay for something. And so, arguably the best case for private medicine, and, 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 and in part liberating both yourself as a patient as well as a physician from the restraints of the payer system is, in instances like this where your doctor understands is to be able to have the screening to identify the risk ahead of that first symptom. And so this it's just it's nowhere better better illustrated than in the area, uh, you know, sadly, of our largest killers. So the problem in, in, in cardiovascular disease is the system is blind. We're blind at a moment in time when technology allows us to see. So a heart attack essentially, in, in very, very simple terms, has two ingredients. There's plaque that builds up in the walls of your arteries. You know, we think of this as cholesterol and it, and it gums up, you know, in the, in the, in the outsides of, the, of your arteries in the wall. And, and that plaque, if you think about it, it's kind of like dynamite. And one day, something ignites the dynamite. That something happens to be, appropriately, inflammation. These two things collide, and under the right circumstances, it turns black into a, into a rupture in that little artery, and it creates a clot, which suddenly overnight forms and obstructs the flow of blood. You have a heart attack, or you have a stroke. Same, same phenomenon, blocking the flow of blood. And so this is how someone can run a marathon, and a month later, drop dead shoveling snow or whatever in their in their in their yard. They you know they, they had no symptoms because the the plaque wasn't obstructing the flow of blood. And one day, somebody they got a gum infection or they you know had psoriasis and arthritis and other inflammatory assaults. And now all of a sudden, they you know, you know they they were symptom free. Now they have a heart attack and they die. And that's how things happen. And so of course, if plaque is 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 ultimately one of two ingredients and it's a culprit. You can imagine how useful our most ubiquitous technology in the world of healthcare is, the stethoscope. A roughly 200-year-old device that amounts to essentially a tin can on the end of a string. And yet it's around the neck of all the doctors that we know. Well, there's a great replacement for that when it comes to, to <coughs> cardiovascular disease prevention, which is this device. Anyone recognize this? Ultrasound. It's not a cheap device, but it's completely safe, completely proven, not expensive to use, requires a little bit of gel, and an operator that understands how to use it, and, and even someone like me can learn how to place this probe on your carotid artery here, which happens to be an incredibly predictive window into your entire vascular system. And what are you looking for? Globs of plaque. If you have plaque in your carotid artery, feeding blood up to your brain, you know, there's plaque elsewhere in your vascular system. So one of the things we're doing different in, in Dr. Burke's practice is, is introducing what we call visual medicine. And that is, let's look for things using the technology that we have now. It's a really great coincidence that she happens to be certified, at, board certified in sports medicine as well as family medicine. She's dealt with obstetrics. This is not a foreign technology to her. It's expensive, but it's not foreign, and she knows how to use it. And we'll get more training to look at vascular, you know, look at vascular issues for her as well. And so she'll be able to look at your carotid artery. She'll be able to look with this at your aorta to see if you have an aneurysm or not. So you don't have to drop dead of that unexpectedly. And so visual medicine is very fundamental. So that's one of the ingredients for a heart attack. The other, as I mentioned, is inflammation. Well, when you go to the doctor ordinarily and you have your checkup, or if you have a company and you have a wellness program and the rare occasion where they draw labs, you know, they're looking at the most simple of things. They're looking at your cholesterol, which we've established is not a predictive risk factor at all, and they'll look at maybe your fasting blood sugar, but the things that actually are waving the flag that you're about to have a heart attack are, are generally not looked at. Why? Not because the labs don't exist, but because they're complicated, they take time to read, the reports are a few pages long, you know, you gotta learn a lot of new stuff as a doctor, and, and unfortunately, you know, amidst managing panels of 3,000 patients, you know, doctors fall further and further behind in keeping current with training. And of course, you know, the labs are a bit exotic, you don't just get them in quests. But we have, you know, we have searched the world for, you know, or at least the country, for the most advanced labs to look at, you know, inflammation as it 
relate specifically to the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. So now we can identify quantitatively whether there's a match, and we can visually identify whether or not there's dynamite. And in doing that, ha the happy news is that there are protocols, requires training, which Dr. Burke and I will be getting uh, in, in early November, you know, to actually manage that risk and to stabilize the dynamite and extinguish the match. And patients can be taught to look for the outward signs of the match being relit. Gum disease, psoriasis, arthritis, there's lots of inflammatory signs, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, lots of things that, that are inflammatory that patients can be taught to look for and be aware of, particularly in the context of whether or not you know you have dynamite lurking in your arteries. Very important. Here's another principle. The idea that we're all identical, that you, me, you know, and him over there are simply the same and should be dealt with the same in, in, in light of our various risks is, is, is simply absurd. But yet, you know, the world of medicine today is very much designed you know, to look at giant populations and to somehow treat us all as though we're the average patient, when of course we aren't. Who's heard, for example, that uh, a glass of red wine and some fish oil is a good thing for your cardiovascular system? Yeah. Well, that's true. 75% of the time, 25% of us have a particular genetic predisposition that makes the opposite true. And so, you know, people take aspirin for their, you know, for their heart. Helpful for most people. Few of us have a genetic predisposition that makes that not helpful for us, and in fact, problematic. The, 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 our genes, while not entirely well understood, many of them are, really can inform a personalized style of treatment of risks and management of risks that if you only know these simple answers, one-time tests, doctors can make vastly better decisions. And so going forward, when you get your lab results back, you'll find that there are gonna be some odd codes of letters and numbers you know, that are particular genes that have been teased out of your labs to help Dr. Burke make smarter decisions and more personalized decisions about your, about your care and prevention. In, a lot of people ask us, what does N1 health mean? N, N1 is the statistical N of one. You know, in, in medical studies, you know, the, the goal is always to get the N to a very large number, a large population of people so that we can understand how these things really work. In the application of, of medicine, we're very fixated on the idea that we're all somewhat unique, which is simply a fact, and applying the N of one principle, personalized medicine, to the patients. Lifestyle is crucial. There's not a drug on earth that can compete with simply exercising and eating properly. And so one of the things that you'll find is this new gadget in the office, which actually just arrived yesterday. And, and it is simply a very fancy scale made by GE that, that somehow, in a painless way, shoots electricity through you and, and it can determine what your percentage of water is. This is, happens to be my report, but it's, it, you know, are, is your body lopsided? Do you have more muscle on one side than the other? How much water, how much fat, how much bone, how much of this, how much that? And so the reason we want to know that is a lot of people will come into the office and they're, what are they called? They're, it's their skinny fat. You look skinny, but in fact, you're all fat and you have no muscle. You know, but yeah, you get on the scale and your height and your weight relate to a healthy body mass index and so off you go, keep up the good work. On the other hand, you have people that come in, they work out all the time and they're bodybuilders or whatever. They have very little fat, but they're simply too heavy for their weight and they're counseled to lose weight. And so, you know, that level of imprecision is just not necessary in this day and time. And so for an investment of money, you, know, you can have a very precise understanding of not only exactly the composition of your body, but precisely how much fat do you have to lose, how much muscle do you have to gain, you know, are you retaining too much water, and it gives the practice an incredible insight you know, into how to work with you on lifestyle matters. And so that health coaching, nutritional education, learning to shop better, these are all things that, again, we have the time in this type of setting to do and can bring the resources in to assist with. Now, I saved my favorite one for last. It doesn't have anything to do with cardiovascular disease, but it's really very cool. Anybody ever concerned with the issue of getting a melanoma? You know, you got moles. Did you think about it? I mean, a lot, I, I, I think I'm covered in moles, but, but I think about it a lot. You know, this is one of these areas of kind of cancer prevention that is, is so poorly handled in the US. I don't know how it is in Sacramento, but in Virginia, it's virtually impossible to get an appointment with a dermatologist. Finally, you do, and you're in there with a nurse practitioner, and they're looking at your body, and you know, if they see something, they have like this chalk line drawing on a piece of paper, and they'll put an X, you know, and then another X on your calf of the chalk line, and you know, off you go to the plastic surgeon who can't figure out which mole he talks about, so he takes four or five off of each spot, and, 
And, uh, you know, it's just the most kind of ridiculous, imprecise, silly system. And so we had a patient about, I don't know, four years ago to die of melanoma in our Virginia practice. And we got to thinking, well, like, surely there's a better way of dealing with this. And so we did a bunch of research to figure out, you know, who's doing what really well with this. And we found that at the Sloan Kettering Melanoma Institute, they were using a German technology called PhotoFinder. And what this does is it simply takes a high-resolution digital image of the whole surface of your skin. And so this is one year, this is the next year. So the next year when you come in, you know, the doctor doesn't have to memorize every mole on every body. The computer simply says, hey, look, we've got three or four new things. This one changed shape. This one's high risk. You know, you, it allows you to zoom in on a mole this big on the screen, and then it will actually risk score the mole for you. And so I learned about this thing. You know, as I said, we researched it, and then we bought one in, in Virginia. And I tend to be in that practice. I'm sort of the guinea pig on uh, of the things that we buy to do to people. And so, you know, if I can't tolerate it, then we probably should send it out to anyone else. And so anyway, we just got this gadget. I had just gotten back from the dermatologist. Had five moles taken off when I only needed two taken off and they couldn't figure out from the chalk line drawing what to take. All five were nothing. And so I still have my healing stitches in me and we get this new gadget. And so I'm like, okay, take off my clothes and I you know, get my picture taken with this high resolution camera. And lo and behold, this daggone thing picks out this seemingly nothing mole right here on me. It's like the size of your pinky nail and it's oval and round and not red or inflamed or anything strange. And the doctor looked at it and he's like, looks normal to me. But the thing kept saying 98th percentile, 98th percentile. And if you blew it up like this big, you could see it had all these little pepper flakes all over it. So I was like, well, what the heck? I have five others taken off. Chop this one off too. And lo and behold, early stage melanoma. Would have sat there at least another year, at least another year un unnoticed. And, uh, and happily, you know, mercifully, that it had not breached, as they say, breached the margin of the scoop and uh, all was well. You know, when it comes to cancer, I regret we don't have any magic formulas to, to solve it. We should all be walking for the early detection, not the cure. You know, it's the early detection that saves the day in, in, in cancer. And this is very much our preoccupation in, in, in this style of practice, is to try and find ways you know, since, you know, since reversing that down the road is tough, to find every conceivable way to find it early. So this is what our job is, you know, mine in particular, you know, is, is this is, it's to combat a problem that most people can't even believe exists. In the world of technology, how long do you think it took Apple to identify the new multi-gigabyte hard drive invented by Toshiba that was small enough to put in an iPod to put in your pocket? Well, in fact, it took less time. They never sold one. They simply told them about it, and bang, it was instantly adopted and applied. You know, the cycle of taking a proven technology and putting it into practice, you know, in every other marketplace that I'm aware of is very, very short, except in healthcare. What do you guess is the average time frame to take a proven technology or a proven new way of doing something and actually having that find its way into the mainstream practice of medicine. How long do you think it takes on average? 10 to 20 years. It's insane. You know, you know in a time where, where everything is swept up and applied overnight, it takes 10 to 20 years. Why? Well, the biggest reason is, and the same reason why there may be, I don't know, there may be two or three photo finders in the whole state of California. I know, and we have the only one in Virginia. You know, it's it's... And I know the ger poor German soul who came over here to try and hawk these things, he can't sell one. Why? Because it's not paid for by insurance. It takes 25 or so minutes to do it. And, you know, in a world where the dermatologist has plenty of business, why in the world do they need this? They can crank out their little mole screenings in 10 minutes, get their, you know, get their, you know, their visit fee or whatever, and, and off they are to the next person. And so, two things. Number one, until, you know, the, 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 the glacier of Medicare happens to come upon a new technology and decide somehow that in population medicine it makes sense to invest in this. It doesn't get paid for it and therefore it can't be sold. The second reason is, is that while doctors are in the salt mines working at a faster and faster pace as our population ages and bears down on them, they don't have time to find these things. So our job, at, you know, at, 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 and really my main job and what I like to do most, is to hunt down these things, elevate them to the attention of the doctors we work with, they can decide if it's real or not, and if it is, then we can apply it. That's our job. Your job is to challenge yourself to graduate into this third era of medicine and to get dirty thinking about what you want to create out of your health so that you can engage with Dr. Burke as a health asset manager. Literally, we're inventing and creating a new type of relationship for doctors, and it's, 
it is a new type of asset management where you come in, you focus on what you want, what you're willing to do to get there, and together, you work through the course of the year to arrive there at the end of the year. And, and every year, your physical is kind of like that check-in with your financial planner. How's the portfolio doing? You know, you've got all your, you know, it's, it's heavily quantified, and you can see exactly how you're doing and recalibrate and adjust course for next year. Even in private medicine, it's a really sad thing. We'll have, we'll have conferences and the private physicians, you know, will, will say things, you know, and you can tell that they're concerned in a way that their patients won't get sick during the year. Because if they don't, they might get to the end of the year and think, why do I need to join this practice? I didn't get sick all year. Well, which is such a crazy thing. It's kind of like, oh, I got an 80% return on my portfolio. I'm firing my financial planner. You know, it's, it, but, but in medicine, unfortunately, because we always think of it in the context of when we're sick and very little about what we're trying to create for ourselves, you know, a lot of private physicians are very preoccupied with this. And my hope is, is that in the, in the year ahead, think recalibrating the way you think, looking at health as an asset and, and as the experience of interacting and partnering with the doctor to create a plan, you know, that hopefully you won't get sick. And at the end of the year, you'll have had lots of interactions with the practice, but they've all been oriented to creating something that you actually want to create. Now, what does return on investment look like in this form of asset management? Certainly there is an economic yield to not being sick. It's expensive to have diseases. You spend money on drugs, you lose productivity, and there's an economic value to that. The more interesting return has to do with this little funky graph, which is plotting over time, essentially your vitality from sick to healthy. And what you find is, is that most people kind of live on the bottom end of this plane. You know, you're born, you've got, you know, you, you, you go to high school, you're in college, you drink too much, now you graduate, you're sitting on your butt all day long at your job, gaining weight, now you weigh 210 when you used to weigh 170, now you're a little insulin resistant, maybe you got a little pre-diabetes going on, but that's okay, we're going to wait for the full-blown thing. You know, then the diabetes sets in, now all of a sudden, holy crap, you have a heart attack, and you're on insulin, and you know, now you have grandkids, and you can't really get up off the couch, so they just sort of sleep on your chest. And you know, then you're in the nursing home, and that just is horrible, horrible, and you're dead. And so that's kind of the, you know, the American health trajectory. And, and we're working on we're working on kind of getting down faster, and then bending this out so we can extend our misery in the ungolden golden years for even longer. And so at greater expense to the system, of course. So the alternative, of course, being, hey, look, you know, the goal is, it, maybe you'll live a little longer, maybe you won't. You know, but the idea is, is that there's some incredible value to a year spent on the couch with the grandkid asleep versus in the driveway with the grandkid playing basketball. You see what I mean? And so this is the, the real yield of private medicine and the third era of medicine in this type of relationship with the doctor, I would submit. So, so that's the return on the investment. So let me tell you a little bit about where we're headed you know, with, with the practice from here. Maybe engage some of your, your, your assistance and participation in this. You know, at, at today's level of, 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 of uh, population in the practice, of membership, there are, assuming nobody on the basis of any of this wants to relinquish their spot in the practice, you know, there are about 87 slots yet to fill. And the way we do this in, in, in markets are we go to Mostly we get patients from, from companies that send management teams in as, their, you know, as, as patients and they tend to send their spouses. Um, physician referrals and physicians themselves are drawn to, to, to these practices. And then of course the patients themselves uh, you know, tend to bring family members and friends and that sort of thing in. And we prefer the latter because we're creating or attempting to create little micro communities of health. And when people know each other and there's some DNA that carries within the practice, that's, that's wonderful. So if you have folks that, that should hear something like this, you know, don't hesitate to say, you know, to, to call them to the attention of Dr. Burke or, or anyone with the, you know, with the staff. But our, our, our hope is to have this filled probably by, I don't know, the start of next year, kind of over the next three or four months. Uh, from your own perspective, you know, the, uh, at some point in time when your membership comes up for renewal, there'll be a new agreement that you can, you can get. It'll be reflective of what you've got in your letter. Uh, we have those here and, and, and Lauren and company will, uh, you know, we have some folks in the back that can get you your new, you know, your new packet so you can see it if you like. Um, if it's not something you want to do, that's okay too. You know, it's it's uh, it, and, and you know, we talked Christine and I about this, and it, you know, it's not this sort of thing isn't for everybody, and it and, and it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings if it's not if it's not for you, and and will you know the whole staff will very gently and, and responsibly help you to you know, to, to find you know a situation that's better suited to you, but don't feel weird about having that conversation with you know, with her. 
And then I know we have some people that, that haven't actually, you know, that aren't members of the practice that have just been brought here as friends or guests or whatever. And of course, uh, you're more than welcome. You might want to see the practice firsthand and sit down with Dr. Burke or whatever. So let us know that as well, and, and we can, you know, we can make that happen also. And uh, and that concludes uh, my little talk. So um, you want to come back and if anybody has questions, but I know we're going to have some food and we can we can eat and hang around and go watch the debate or whatever. <laughs> but uh, but it really has been a pleasure to talk to you all. And, and even though I don't know all of you, it's you know it's been fun to you know, be able to kind of share this. I hope it's helpful for you. Um, you mentioned, I think, four of the early detection devices in your slideshow. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other ones that you're seeing on, in the future? And, you know, that is a great question. The, uh, the question is, do we have other technologies and early detection devices that we're, that we're looking at? Um, some of the things that we're, that, we're, that we're working on, actually, kind of the most interesting one is not actually a technology. There's a, there's a book that came out, and this is just kind of give you some insight into how we spend our time. Back at, back at, in one How health. he spends his yeah. time. <laughs> you know, there's a book that came out not long ago. It's called Healers, Extraordinary Clinicians at Work. And it's by a pair of researchers at Vanderbilt University. And, and to my knowledge, and theirs, it's the first time the topic of healing has been addressed in a non-religious or spiritual way. And they have studied a group of doctors, I think 50, 50 physicians and other healthcare providers that are regarded as, as being incredible healers. And what they've looked for are the skill sets that they have in common with one another. And anyway, I've gotten to know the author of this book and we're working on developing a, a, a essentially a coaching program for in one health doctors to teach the skills that they've identified, you know, the common, there's eight of them, you know, so, you know, and, and apply those in, in, the, in the practice setting. So that's kind of a new and different technology. We're working on it, and, and we'll, we'll bring that in. Um, we have, uh, on the lifestyle medicine side of things, we're, we're really interested in uh, working with, with health coaches that, uh, you know, that can kind of carry the baton. You know, behavioral change is a tough thing. It's, it's, it's arguably the toughest medicine that there is to, you know, to, to swallow. And we've been working on a, um, a really different approach to looking at both health as a creation as well as as well as changing behavior in order to do it and and kind of turning on its head the way that it's always been done ordinarily you go into the doctor let's say and the doctor says you know Tom you know you're you're too fat you you're, you need to lose weight or you're gonna have a heart attack or you're gonna have diabetes I mean you probably people have had conversations like this with doctors you know in, in, in the healthcare system it's you know they see what you need to do and logically, they jump to the conclusion they should scare the crap out of you, you know, so that you'll change your ways. And so the problem with that is that we have discovered, just watching our own clients, is that the resolution of problems as they pertain to our health is, is you know, it's, it's almost always sort of an oscillating structure. You know, I'm too fat. I need to lose weight. I get a little skinnier, my problem gets smaller, my resolve gets less, I gain weight again, I get fat, I, and, and so you're, you're constantly yo-yoing. And this is, it's most evident in, health, in weight because you know, we kind of go up and down and that's, that's the issue. So there's an author of a book, and I have to admit now, I shamelessly have plagiarized his title in my title. His book is called Your Life as Art. And, and essentially, you know, he's a person, he's, he's a musician and creative consultant that's never really applied this thinking to health, but we're teaching ourselves, you know, at, at in one, how to how to teach folks, you know, rather than approaching you know health issues as problems to be solved, looking at what we're trying to create, which is alternatively what they call an advancing structure. I I, I lose weight to create health, not go on a diet to lose weight. I lose weight to create health. I get a little healthier. My perspective on what health is changes. And now instead of being skinnier, I think I want to start running. And I start running and now my perspective changes and I decide I want to be vegan or whatever. You know, and, and it's a fascinating thing that, that I have actually experienced firsthand over the last few years. But in any case, that's another, it's a technology in a sense. Um, I'm trying to think of any other cool gadgets we're looking at. One that we, we, we tried and dismissed. Uh, the transnasal esophoscope. Oh, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the uh, maybe the fastest growing cancer is esophageal cancer. 
And, uh, and so it's funny. I'll tell you, I'll hang around and tell you these stories. So if you get, anybody gets a sense of who want to eat, just kind of stop. But anyway, it turns out that this is a problem. It's kind of vexing to a lot of people. Why is it that younger and younger people are having these weird signs of reflux when in fact they don't have reflux? And, uh, and, and, and the, the worldwide authority on this is a, uh, is, a, is a person named Jamie Kaufman in New York who we had come and speak at a conference. And, uh, and, and the technology that, uh, you know, that, that she uses to, to study this is, is this transnasal esophoscope. So you stick this thing up your nose, down your throat, no, while you're perfectly awake, by the way, and you can get it all the way down into your stomach and look around at things, not too far in your stomach, but just past that valve or whatever, and you can see if things are going wrong down there. And, and what was wild is, number one, it's not as miserable as you'd think, but it's really off-putting to people. So I've shoved it up my nose, and you know, and it, you know down it goes, you don't gag or anything, you sip some water, and you really can't see everything. But, um, but, uh, but no one wanted to tolerate it, it was just too freaky for people, so we couldn't get anyone to use it, so we didn't end up applying it. But what's really wild is, it turns out that the problem that we're having has a great deal, her, her thesis is, and when she did her presentation, which was really fascinating, is what we're eating is eating us. The acidification of our food is causing, you know, by, by drinking sodas and things that will clean acid off batteries, you know, we're actually creating reflux without it coming back up out of our stomach. We're just, it's so freaking acidic going down that it just burns things up in there. And so, you know, that's why we have all this, uh, you know, all these esophageal problems. So, anyway, that was one that we tried and just couldn't get adoption of. And so, anyway, those are.